Space Cowboys was brought to Clint about two and a half years ago by the studio. Um, they brought the story to him about these uh, astronauts going, these older astronauts going to uh, into space on a, on a launch. And it became co politically correct when John Glenn went up into space. Uh, Clint, at, at the beginning, wasn't that interested in it, but as, they, as he read the script, he saw something in the characters that in agreement that he was going to do this show. He uh, took the script and went up and saw uh, George Lucas at ILM. Uh, George had a lot of ideas uh, because there's a lot of shots to try to create space. As people know, there are effect shots, um, and there's a lot of work in that. So they came to an agreement on it, and Clint uh, came back here and started working, finishing the show we were working on. And George and his group started doing drawings and figuring out the shots we were going to need and what he thought was going to take to make this work. And so they started animating these uh, shots. And then they, before we shot the film, uh, they brought us down a, a tape of one of the scenes they did with some animated movement of the characters and the action and what was going to happen with voiceovers by the actors from their people working there saying the lines and trying to figure out a timing of how it was going to work. If you look at this film and you look at the shots that ILM did and they are incredible and everyone who's seen this film uh, talks about how real space is. One of the toughest scenes to cut in this film uh, was the crashing of the icon down on the shuttle because I had these animatic shots at that time and I didn't know exactly how long they were going to shoot these sh particular shots. And, you know, a film is a, is a collaboration of a lot of people. Not only do we have uh, ILM doing all their work, but when we get in the post him, we have to have Alan Murray and Bub Asman do all the sound effects and create the sounds to correlate with that to make it work together. I mean, like anything, uh, people say, well, what constitutes a good edit? Well, I say, what constitutes good music? It's something that happens that you don't see. Uh, when we were shooting the icon scene, uh, we had a big, uh, we had a whole stage set up here, and it was all tarped in black because they had to have everything blacked out. I mean, we had three Chapman cranes there. Clint is, as everybody knows, a fast director. He shoots about 35 to 40 setups a day, and in this, we came to a screeching halt the first day. We got like two or three shots. And on the second day, I came down there, and I said, well, how's it going? And uh, we were walking out to lunch, and his wife, Dina, was with us. And he says, now I remember why, after Firefox, I said I wouldn't do one of these again. And I said, well, it's been 20 years. And Dina kind of chuckled in and said, well, in the next 20 years, we'll do another one. Hey, wow, look at that. That's right. And when I meet those guys, that makes me feel good, that they can sit with their family and go, hey, look at, you see, boy, they got that right, instead of what they normally do. Uh, well, okay, it's a movie. So that's nice. What Ireland has done is uh, to uh, set the pace for the exterior shots in, in space is we have a bunch of miniatures. This is a miniature of the opening sequence of the, of the X2, but we, have, we built a lot of miniatures uh, as in the shuttle and other uh, space vehicles up there. We photograph as objective views, and then we're cutting in um, stage elements, meaning we shot the interior of the cockpit, and we cut that into the interior of our miniatures so that they're sort of incorporated and it looks like everybody's there. As an example of how we put uh, the visuals into a scene, for example, if there's a shot of the shuttle up in space and there's an interior shot of the guys, you cut to the outside and you see uh, the big shuttle and you see the guys inside the cockpit you can see them through the windows what we end up doing is we photograph a large miniature of the shuttle in front of a blue screen it's so we can extract the model out of the image Then we also develop a star field and we put that behind the photographed miniature of the uh, shuttle but it's composited together so that the shuttle by itself then you've got a star field behind it that we develop and then we take an image that we photographed of the guys on the set who are in the cockpit, and we put them image-wise into the cockpit of the shuttle. So you've got these relatively three elements. You've got the um, shuttle, you've got a star field, and then you've got the guys inside the, the, the um, cockpit. And that's generically how we do most shots. Granted, some things get far more complicated. There's a few more details to all this stuff. But in a simple form, that's really what happens. We did a, um, an animatic, what we call an animatic, which is a, sort of a mock-up sort of 
low-tech version of the movie, sort of like an animation. And in doing this, we uh, you know, scripted it out and whatnot, and then Clint could take a look at this stuff and see what was working, what was not working. Inclusive of that concept in this animatic, because we basically did an animatic for the last quarter of the movie while they're in space. And um, in doing that, it's sort of like a storyboard, uh, but it's in motion. And in doing that, we also worked out the sort of lighting diagram of where we are in space, what time of day this is, or what time in space it is. Is the sun up? Is the moon up? What works dramatically timing-wise with the different light schemes? Then uh, after this was approved and Clint liked what we were doing, I went over this with the uh, director of photographer, Jack Green, and just said, OK, is this going to work for you on your sets and whatnot? Because we certainly had to uh, collaborated on how we were going to approach this stuff. And so we came up with a scheme of, of how and when things happen timing-wise, either uh, where everything's moving in space or what the sun was doing, what the moon was doing, what time of day it was. And it, it, it just all a little choreography and understanding. As long as all of us knew what was supposed to happen, then everything should work out just fine. Most things that we do uh, visual effects-wise are always unusual. Um, but uh, it's all just, it's just a puzzle. Square pegs and round holes, things like that. So, uh, pilot, uh, I, I've never had an ambition to be a jet pilot either. I've never, uh, I've, I fly helicopters, but I don't, I never got into the idea of going into space and being stuck in a little tiny compartment like those guys did, when you think of the X1 and the X2 program, they wanted it badly to, to have that thrill. To me, that's claustrophobic as hell. There's effects, and there's visual effects, and then special effects, and they're putting all that together. It's different for me. Uh, I'm, I'm used to shooting just more or less stories with characters and just kind of forging right on ahead. This way, uh, this stuff can bog you down sometimes. It's, it's coming out fine, but it's... Uh, uh, I guess when you hear so the horror stories of what goes on in some companies, and you know, take two or three days to make a shot, that that would really be uh, depressing. But we <laughs> blew uh, two or three shots a day at the at minimum, and uh, you think, God, that's the worst feeling in the world is leaving this film. But uh, he's perfect. He's perfect. I, I watched uh, a documentary on Wild Bill Weldman. Richard Widmark was saying how intimidated he was and going in for the first take with William Wilder. And Widmark said he was nervous and uh, his first thing to do was to mount a horse. So he stuck his left foot in the stirrup, started to get up, the foot slipped out and he fell on the ground. And he turned around and uh, Wellman said, that's fine. He said, no, 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 let me, let me do another take. And Wellman said, no, it's not necessary. That's your chance. And then they showed the cut footage. And you see Richard Woodmark going up to the horse, his left leg rising, and then you cut to the other side, and his right leg comes over the head. And it's so beautiful. And, and Clint, Clint's like that, except he's very gentle. He's a, he's a man. He's, a, he's the most wonderful, elegant, honest, genuine man. Yeah, my history with Clint goes back quite a ways. Uh, in 19... Well, I can't even remember the year. Uh, I started as a B camera operator on the gauntlet. And uh, when they were getting ready, after the gauntlet finished, we were going to start up on uh, Every Which Way But Loose. The operator that had previously done the gauntlet was unavailable. So I moved from a from B camera to A camera as the camera operator and then did 14 more pictures with Clint along about uh, Heartbreak Ridge, he, Clint asked me if I would move up to director of photography. I've had some experience with the CGI, the blue screens, and uh, quite a bit of experience from Twister and, and Speed 2 and, uh, and some other uh, things that have taken place throughout my career as an operator and director of photography. So uh, it is not so foreign to me, but in the Clint Eastwood environment of filmmaking, a, a fellow that loves the energy of first takes, shoot the rehearsal, move fast. This is a very tedious environment for him. So I try to make it as simple as possible. In terms of lighting, I, I, we looked at what it was like to be in, an, in the orbiter. We saw what the lighting was. I duplicated it. I don't change it. 
I'm not trying to make a, a romance novel or a, or, or a big explosion effect show or anything like that. This is about astronauts under duress that are just handling it in their normal environment. If it's something that he doesn't like, you know it right away because it's he'll <laughs> it's done it. <laughs> I love him for it. He's just so great. He's so brave. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a very dramatic scene, and they'll be I'll have a little eye light for the darkness of the face, and he'll say, "Let's can we snap this light off?" Started at that trying to make this picture uh, an honest representation of what it is. Now this is the mid deck, and. Uh, they go through uh, a hole here up into the flight deck is above this. And uh, actually, there's just, on most flights, there's four in the flight deck when it takes off, and two are in down here. But Clint That's wanted all man. six up in the uh, uh, flight deck. So we've, we've lengthened that. We've made it a little larger. We added four feet. And that's four feet of lots of instruments and uh, technical things. We worked uh, closely with ILM and their building models. Uh, I think they're building about an eight or nine foot model of the, of the shuttle. And then they're also building the satellite, of which we're, we're matching just a section of it, but it's a very complicated set. I think we've been drawing on that for, for two and a half or three months. We're matching mission control at Houston. Big, beautiful set with all the consoles and the TV screen. In physical condition, age really isn't the issue. There isn't anything to say that someone could not do that, if, even if they were older. All right, cowboys. To get this uh, large Russian satellite out of Earth orbit and to the moon. And so uh, that's, that's not something that's, that's absolutely easy to do. When the orbiter re-enters, uh, it really does glow. There's hot plasma off the, uh, the orbiter that's being uh, projected, and on a clear night, you can actually see it. Uh, we will see it come over Texas, depending on uh, whether it's a ascending node or a descending node entry, and you can actually see it through the sky. So it does actually get hot, uh, over 2,900 degrees on the leading edge of the orbiter. Uh, yeah, it gets that hot. The reality is if you can get overhead uh, at about Mach 1, 40,000 feet or so, uh, you could bring it in to land it. Uh, you fly uh, around a, a heading alignment cone of around seven, uh, seven nautical miles, uh, and then you, you turn in on to final. Once you get on to final, we're trained. My perspective, uh, it, it really was pretty much the story that we wrote. Uh, there, there really weren't a whole lot of deviations. I'm sure we can go into that, but uh, just just to actually see what you were crafting in your head, sitting in a room together, uh, little just little things. I think primarily were, were the things that just blew me away, and just to actually see Clint Eastwood and Tommy Lee Jones actually becoming these people that you essentially create. And it's uh, you know it's the main reason you do this job. And, uh, you know, these guys are just such icons, starting with Colin Eastwood, that the uh, fortuitousness of just having been involved in a, in a project with someone like him, him in particular, who was a hero to both of us growing up, and then to actually, you know, be involved in an artistic endeavor with this, with this giant is just is really remarkable, and to have him trust ideas that you've come up with, and then... Uh, see, the idea for Space Cowboys uh, originally came from a producer named Andrew Lazar, who uh, met with me and had the germ of an idea about uh, a bunch of old astronauts who never got their chance to go into space, who are then recruited for a space mission, and that was all there was to it at the time. And um, I then uh, fleshed out the idea, which is essentially what what you see on the screen, how he was uh, not yet involved in the project at this time. I was ready when he called up with the script and said, you know, I, I could use you on this one. And so it's, it's kind of a many years friendship that started in time. Yeah. See, this guy, he wanted to be an astronaut when he grew up. I wanted to be a rock star. So it was very helpful with the, <laughs> uh, with the technical stuff. And it, just, it was a good balance, I think, for yeah. this guy. He advised on the score, actually.
I think Clint's uh, first first um, hesitation about the project is, was the scope of it, and that he he wondered if somebody would believe that these four men in their 60s and early 70s could you know feasibly you know be sent into space. And, um, and then uh, we were very lucky. John Glenn uh, announced that he was going to go into space. Yeah, his first comment was, I think it's a little implausible that somebody. You know, my age is going to be piloting the space shuttle, and it's going to be kind of hard to, to get that by people. And it was, uh, oh my gosh, it was probably two, three months after Warners had bought the script that NASA makes this big announcement that uh, Senator John Glenn is going to return to space, who's uh, a lot older than Clint. My last script was, uh, my last movie that got made was Muppets from Space. So I have a space theme kind of. You uh, can really see the expertise, running. you know, crossing over in the two movies, yeah. I think. Tommy Lee does that Fozzie thing, and that just... Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is my first movie. This, this is my first one. I uh, kind of sequestered myself on an old wooden boat about 10 years ago and just decided to learn how to screenwrite. It took me 12 <laughs> passes at it, and uh, this was lucky number 13 for me, uh, Space Cowboy. So that's, this is my first movie. Mm -hmm. 